Well, folks, welcome to one more edition of Politics and Random. Berto Willis, your host. Thank you so kindly for being a part of the show. We're going to have a great show for you today. Uh, a bit of a couple of minutes late. I'm still trying to process some videos that I want to show you guys today. And we are going to do it, my dear brothers and my dear sisters. We are going to do it. Lo vamos a estar. Lo, va, or, lo vamos a estar. What am I saying? Lo vamos a hacer. Lo vamos a hacer ahorita mismo. I'm still doing some clipping here. Bear with me as I get one more share done. And then I think I will have it appropriately done. Uh, let me get the Palestine one up. There we go. Let me get the Israel stuff up. Uh, para ver, para ver, para ver. Estoy listo para hacer esto. And we are ready to go. How are my peeps doing today? Welcome aboard. Welcome aboard Eric Hayes from King Watascasita, Michael Rutnin from Brooklyn, New York. We also have Paul Fleming from uh, Powder Springs, Georgia. We also have Bridge MCP, upstate New York, Binghamton, New York, that is. Uh, Diggs, uh, Diggs BTW7. Hey, what's up? Uh, Diggs, where are you from? Are you my my good brother Diggs here in Houston, Texas, or Katy, Texas, I believe? Let me know. And the one and only Patrick Magner. Yeah, are you here for the show again, Patrick? Great to have you here, my brother. Yvette Avery Herod was one of the first to log in. And where is she from? In, for um, Atlanta, Georgia. And let's see, I think I got everybody so far. I think I've got everybody so far. How's everybody doing? Digs, does anyone still use dig.com? I don't think so. I don't think so. All right, you know, Bridge, I was going to start. I know Harris called out Brett very well. We're going to talk about that in a little minute here because I got the whole clip. She made mincemeat out of Brett. And, you know, a lot of there are a lot of people, oh, my God, because Brett was nasty. He came out charging like a, you know, you know what he reminded me of? Did any of you guys see that clip where the couple interviewed Tanahesi Coates and how he started? Uh, he, he, he really started the interview not as an interview, but as an attack. He pretty much called Tanahesi ter- uh, uh, Coates a terrorist sympathizer. OK, and that was not cool at all. Right. So I saw that and I'm like, that is crazy. I that guy's a very progressive guy that I expected a lot out of. And when I saw that, it completely changed my opinion. You know, that is Katie Turr's husband. And, you know, I have a soft spot for Katie because she's the one that Trump really tried to give a hard time several times around. But no. Anyway. Let's go ahead and and see what else. Try to mansplain to her. He was trying to mansplain. I mean, I, he was just completely inept. I sent you Trump's Q and A on Telemundo in Messenger. Thank you, Paul. I hadn't seen the full Q and A. Just saw the one where where he refused to say that. Uh, what was it about? He refused to tell this guy that September six was real. I mean, that September January six was real. It's just amazing uh, where these guys are. Okay. Michael Rudnick says, looks like the posts from the previous episode were on the Twitch screen. No, that is, yeah, th- that is probably the rerun of uh, of this morning. All right. Let's continue. We also have Michael Rudnick says, most of my fellow Greens care. They berated me as much for suggesting voting blue instead of green this election cycle. Michael Rudnick, when you are an activist, it it takes bravery sometimes. You have to buck some of the the loud mouths within your own party because a lot i know a a humongous amount of greens that are sensible and are saying you know what in this particular election we cannot vote for uh the green we cannot go with jill stein in fact i got called uh, you know i got a long letter rather a listener to this morning show sent a long letter to our to the manager of kpft to complain that I was unbiased in the way I covered Jill Stein and that uh, I, I misrepresent all kinds of stuff, right? It wasn't true. I mean, I, because I didn't correct somebody that said that, uh, I didn't add that, that when David Duke endorsed Jill Klein, I didn't go immediately and said, but she reneged on the, but she said she didn't want the endorsement. 
I just let the person talk. I and you know our lines were filled up. I, I'll be honest. Technically speaking, I should have said, "Well, Jill Stein went against it." I wasn't trying to be malicious or anything. So we had a caller who called in, and that caller called in and said, "I want to correct the record. Yes, uh, David Duke endorsed Jill Stein, but Jill Stein reneged on it." And I said, "Come on into the show," and she told the story. It wasn't, you know, again, this is independent media. We do our job. That wasn't good enough for him. So he called uh, or he sent a letter to the manager of the radio station saying how disappointed he was in me. So I wrote him back and I said, first of all, thank you for being for listening to it at KPFT. But also, I wanted you to know that I, before you say you're disappointed in me, attempt to correct something on the station that we, we've said. And if we don't allow the correction or if it's something that we've done maliciously, then you should be disappointed. But otherwise, it's a complete double standard that you're trying to hold me to. I hope you understood that. I was very civil in the way I discussed that. Anyway, continuing. Uh, what we have here is, uh, let's see. <clears throat> Bree says, Harris called out Brett, closed up his face when he told him he was pretty much lying. He smirked. He knew he lied. He didn't only smirk, Bridge. He shut up. That was the most important part. She got him shocked because he didn't expect her to really find out that he was trying to pull a hoodwink on not her, a hoodwink on his people. And he figured she was too. Uh, inept to know how to come back at him without just saying, you're lying, you're lying. She came back intelligently in, in, in that piece. But anyhow, Paul Fleming says, I voted yesterday. Yay, Paul. <laughs> Glad that you voted. Maywood from Long Beach, California is in. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Paul says, there has been a doubling of petitions by workers uh, to have union representation during President Joe Biden's administration, according to the figures released Tuesday by the National Labor Board. During Trump's president's union petitions declined 22%. And yet, and yet the unions were attempt, uh, are, 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 many of them are not endorsing Kamala because their workers are voting for Trump. Uh, that is what you call mental illness. And that's why you have to work on these people. Mental illness. Melanie Keelan from Barcelona, Spain is in the house. And Mike Cisak is in the house. Of course, he's telling me, as usual, Egberto constantly misrepresents people. Wow. Let me just tell you, Jill Stein, I like Jill Stein. In this case, Jill Stein is just wrong. I sat down, just Jill Stein and myself, and had a salad together. She likes her salads with habanero peppers sliced up in the salad. Then she told me, taste it. You're going to like it. You can handle pepper. And I tried it. So I have no malice against Jill Stein, but Jill Stein is wrong here. We have a, an existential problem for our democracy. And it takes us not being self-centered. It takes us not only thinking about ourselves. It, takes a, it also means that we need to get rid of some of our privilege. Because whilst a Trump administration won't hurt Jill Stein, she has enough capital to cover for the rest of her life. It'll hurt a lot of people we care for. So I don't only vote. There's a caller that called in today and said, yeah, I understand. I can't only vote for myself. I have to vote for my children. I have to vote for my friends. I have to vote for the ones, the lesser of us. That's what empathy is all about. All right, let's see. Uh, Michael says, Egberto, in a first pass, the post system, a physician occasionally uses third parties to pull disgruntled voter voters away from two main parties. The alt-right will disingenuously push leftists toward the Green Party, only caring that Democrats get fewer votes, not any ideological value. You nailed it. Bruce Pollard is in the house. She did well last night. She did very well last night. You're going to see the piece that I pulled out of it. I think you know which piece it is. Too many people are told they must believe and repeat something that is clearly not true. Very true, Bruce. 
Uh, Michael Segberto, if you take a look at my post trying to get my fellow Greens to vote blue this time around, there was only one objection, the Biden-Harris support for Israel, who are engaged in genocide, which we all agree with, or most of us agree with. Greens would not vote for that. They see Jill Stein as a greater good and have a moral objection, a moral stand, and they don't care if their vote amounts to a protest vote. But what they don't care about, and that tells you a bit more about them, uh, Brother Rudnan. Think about this. If they know that if Trump were to get elected, it'll drop Social Security or reduce Social Security. It'll re it will cause inflation. All these things that we know are going to happen if this guy gets elected, which will hurt a lot of people. And they still, because... They want to do a protest vote so they can feel good that they screw the man. Or in this case, they screw the woman. Right? That shows more about their character, their morals. And, it, it, you know, progressives have good policies, right? Progressive believes in equity and all of that. But they, the same evil that exists within the right exist within the left as well. Notice I'm not saying all the right is evil. I'm not saying all the left is good. What I am saying is the same way somebody on the right with their absolutist view of abortion that will get several women killed is no different than somebody on the left voting for Donald Trump that will kill quite a few women. They're doing the same thing, just from a different angle. No different. Michael says, Egberta, the green view is screwed the, the, the duopoly. Yeah, I know. But if you're going to screw the duopoly to cause the death of a lot of Americans, makes no sense, right? You've defeated the purpose. All right, let's go with the first video. Donald Trump uh, needs to be called out more often. Donald Trump claimed that, you know, John Deere was going to move a factory to Mexico. And if they move that factory to Mexico, he told them that you'll never, you know, I don't remember, you know, you know that he, he's always talking crap about what he's going to do if they don't listen to him, etc. Now, John Deere, he said, after he said that, they decided they're not going to move to Mexico because of what I did. Of course, John Deere came out and said, for all practical purposes, Donald Trump is full of it. Want you to listen to this and then we'll take it on the other side. They just announced yesterday they're probably not going to build the plants, okay? I kept the jobs, the jobs here. Donald Trump this week claiming he persuaded the Deer Company to reconsider its move to Mexico. However, that company says the claim is not true. According to a statement given to the Wall Street Journal, Deer says it didn't make any announcement about canceling plans to build farm tractor cabs and some construction machinery at plants in Mexico. Let's bring in the co-anchor of CNBC Squawk Box and New York Times columnist Andrew Ross Sirk. Andrew, obviously, uh, if what Donald Trump had said were true there, it would have been news to a lot of people. Uh, turns out it wasn't true. I mean, it's just so vexing because this goes to the very issue of, of truth. You know, we often talk about you know, what you can see with your own eyes. You just saw a video of former President Trump saying very directly that he was responsible uh, for this company announcing something that this company did not announce. I mean, it's just, it's literally uh, like, you know, it's sunny out today and it's like saying it's raining. And it's so clear, it's so clear. The lie is so evident. And so when people talk about, you know, sometimes when people say that the media is biased or this or that towards one person or another. And I always say, I think that the journalists are biased towards truth. That's what we're biased towards. And when you have these so blatant examples of just just demonstrable lying, it's very hard to get your head around how you're supposed to believe anything. 
Um, I will also add one other piece of news to this this morning, which is actually interesting, which is that Deer did announce that they're going to be cutting about 300 jobs, uh, in part because they're saying that farmers in America are struggling and struggling to be able to afford some of their products. Now, that's an interesting point to make. Because if you start to think about where President, former President Trump was going with his plan for tariffs against a company like Deer, you start to think about who is going to be injured. Who is going to be injured if those, if those cabs are made ultimately in Mexico? The farmers, uh, because, or rather if there's a tariff, because the farmers can't afford uh, to buy uh, the tractors that they need to produce uh, their own profits. It's it's a very circular uh, and vexing conundrum slash problem slash lie. And I, as you can tell, I'm sort of vexed by it and don't really know what else to say. Yeah. And that that is the thing. He he just lies. And the thing about it is, the the biggest problem is the sycophancy, the folks that follow him. They are they are okay with a person who lies to them consistently over and over again. You cannot run a country when the person you're running with is just a liar because you don't ever know when the person is telling the truth. Patrick says Trump's posture with Iran in his first term makes it difficult to believe that we will not have a full-scale war uh, with them in a second term. Paul Fleming says CNN hosts couldn't contain their laughter as they discussed Trump's $100,000 Swiss made watch, which led a reporter to a Wyoming mall and a company selling male enhancements honey laced with Viagra. The absurdity of Trump's watch promotion being connected to such a product had them in fits, adding yet another layer of bizarre to the Trump campaign. Imagine if uh, Kamala Harris did something like that. Imagine. Bridge MCP said, what is the cheering? Egberto Willis, you taping something else at the same time? I hope not. You hear cheering? Uh, when are you hearing? Are you hearing cheering right now? Because you shouldn't be. I don't think I see anything else that's in that channel. Please let me know if you're still hearing some sort of cheering. <clears throat> All right. Michael Radin says Eric doesn't understand what Greens wants for our economy: infrastructure investment, renewable energy, living wages, universal health care. Greens have an environmental focus in their economic views to make such sure uh, we work with nature, not try to dominate it until the backlash, which is how capitalism works against capitalism works. Capitalism is just, a, a, like I said, it's just a, 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 a capital grab by all means necessary. And, you know, like I mentioned on KPFT, our goal should be to teach Americans what it really is. Not the fable that's told that they've been told their entire lives. All right, but it says during the video you just played, huh? I don't know where that came from. I'm going to have to listen to that in detail because there shouldn't have been anything else that I can think of that was playing while I was recording that video. All right, also, uh, para ver, para ver, para ver, para ver. Take a look outside the window. Something going on. <laughs> Paul Fleming says, break in. Former Trump Secretary of Defense, retired four-star James Mattis, calls Trump the most dangerous person in America after previously describing him as a threat to the Constitution. Retweet to thank General Mattis for standing up for democracy. I'll do that after the program. Michael Rudnan says capitalism treats the environment like an afterthought, an externality to push off the book. It doesn't treat it at all. If it can make some money on it, it will. All right, let's see. Uh, capitalism pays for all the progressive free stuff. Actually, the free stuff isn't the progressive free stuff. The free stuff goes to the red states. Remember that. Red states are, repeat after me, Eric. Red states are the, the states dependent on the blue states. Let's repeat. Repeat after me. Red states depend on the work of blue states. Red states are takers. Repeat after me, Eric. 
Red states are takers. Look at the numbers. The free stuff comes from the blue states. All right. Okay. Let's continue. Michael Rudden makes some money off the environment. Yeah, by treating the air and water as open sewers. <laughs> uh, Rudden, I mean, Eric, it's not a question, okay, as far as whether I am asking or not. Red states are the beggar states. All right. Red states beg. Blue states are the ones who provide the monies to the red states. That's a statement of fact that if you ever wanted to learn, you could do so. All right, let's go to the Kamala. Or hear me, look at me sounding like Trump. To the Kamala, to the Kamala uh, debate, or not debate, but interview, where she annihilates Brett Bear. Kamala Harris went into the lion's den, Fox News, and for all practical purposes, she made such mincemeat out of Brett that it turned out that he said, uh, I think it's to Sean Hannity, he said, yeah, she got some, uh, some, some good snippets out of that. You know, he got some viral moments out of that. And the reality is true. And the reason why is there, are, there will always be a lot of viral moments to get out of somebody as incompetent as Donald Trump. And while they try to put her on the spot, what she did is held up that reflection mirror. And as she held up that reflection mirror, she just used all the questions that Brett had against him. Why? Because again, they, but, but I tell you the best, I, watch this little snippet here and then we'll take it on the other side. Your campaign slogan is a new way forward, and it's time to turn the page. You've been vice president for three and a half years. So what are you turning the page from? Well, first of all, turning the page from the last decade in which we have been burdened with the kind of rhetoric coming from Donald Trump that has been designed and implemented to divide our country and have Americans literally point fingers at each other. Rhetoric and an approach to leadership that suggests that the strength of a leader is based on who you beat down instead of what we all know. The strength of leadership is based on who you lift up. You, the strength of an Vice American president. president, which is one who understands that the vast majority of us have more in common than what separates us. Madam that Vice is President, more than 70 percent of people that is tell about turning the page on rhetoric that people are frankly exhausted of, Brett. More than 70 percent of people tell the country is on the wrong track. They say the country is on the wrong track. If it's on the wrong track, that track follows three and a half years of you being vice president and President Biden being president. That is what they're saying, 79 percent of them. Why are they saying that? If you're turning the page, you've been in office for three and a half years. And Donald Trump has been running for office. But since you've been the person been, holding the office. Come on. Madam you vice and I president. both know what I'm talking about. You and I both know what I'm talking about. I actually about. don't. What are you talking about? What I'm talking about is that over the last decade, but people you're the have lever become. Of power. But listen. Over the last decade, it is clear to me, and certainly the Republicans who are on stage with me, the the, the former chief of staff to the president, Donald Trump, uh, former defense secretaries, national security advisor, and his vice president, one that he is unfit to serve, that he is unstable, that he is dangerous, and that people are exhausted with someone who professes to be a leader who spends full time demeaning and, and, and engaging in personal grievances and it being about him Madam instead Vice of President, the American people. People are case, tired of that. If that's the case, why is half the country supporting him? Why is he beating you in a lot of swing states? Why, if he's as bad as you say, that half of this country is now supporting this person who could be the 47th president of the United States? Why is that happening? This is an election for president of the United States. It's not supposed to be easy. I know, but it's if not it's supposed to be. It, 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 it is not supposed to be. So a are they misguided? The 50 percent? Are they listen, stupid? What, oh what God, is it? I would never say that about the American people. And in fact, if you listen to Donald Trump, if you watch any of his rallies, he's the one who tends to demean and belittle and diminish 
the American people. He's the one who talks about an enemy within, within, an enemy within, talking about the American people, suggesting he would turn the American military on the American people. We asked that the, question to the former president today. Harris Faulkner had a, a town hall, and this is how he responded. I heard about that. They, they were saying I was like threatening. I'm not threatening anybody. They're the ones doing the threatening. They do phony investigations. I've been investigated more than Alphonse Capone. He was the greatest. Oh no, it's right. true. We've no, but think question. of it. It's called weaponization of government. It's a terrible thing. So, Brad, I, I'm sorry. And with all due respect, that clip was not what he has been saying about the enemy within that he has repeated when he's speaking about the American people, that's not what you just showed. Well, he was asked no, about that no, specific... No, no, that's clip. not what you just showed in all no, fairness no, no, no. and I'm respect you to that you. I'm you the question that we asked him. Uh, you didn't show that, and here's the bottom line. He has repeated it many times, and you and I both know that. And you and I both know that he has talked about turning the American military on the American people. He has talked about going after people who are engaged in peaceful protest. He has talked about locking people up because they disagree agree with him. This is a democracy. And in, in a democracy, the president of the United States in the United States of America should be willing to be able to handle criticism without saying he'd lock people up for doing it. And this is what is at stake, which is why you have someone like the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff saying what Mark Milley has said about Donald Trump being a threat to the United States of America. He's quoted in the Bob Woodward book that way, yes. L let me ask you this, no, Madam no, Vice President. You call Donald Trump. The you, you, you of that. call Donald Trump. Um, he's misguided. You say now he's he unstable. Is unstable. He is unstable, but uh, he's not well. well. You say he's it, mentally not stable. Uh, he's not stable. Let me ask you this. And, you and told we many interviewers that Joe Biden was on his game, that ran around circles on his staff. When did you first notice that President Biden's mental faculties appeared diminished? Joe Biden, I have watched in from the Oval Office to the Situation Room, and he has the judgment and the experiment and experience to do exactly what he has done in making very important decisions on behalf of the American people. There Joe Biden, no Brett, concerns raised. Brett, Joe Biden is not on the ballot. I understand. And Donald Trump, Donald Trump but is. But you talked about it. And Donald Trump After is. After George Clooney said and within a few minutes of talking to Donald President Biden Trump, at a fundraiser that he thought this Brett, was not the same Brett, Joe Biden that we saw on the Donald debate stage. Donald Trump is on the ballot. I understand. You met with him at least once a week for three and a half years. You didn't have any concerns? I think the American people have a concern about Donald Trump, which is why the people who know him best including leaders of our national security community have all spoken out. Even people who worked for him in the Oval Office worked with him in the Situation Room and have said he is unfit and dangerous and should never be president of the United States again, including his former vice president, which is why the job was open for him to choose another running mate. So that is a fact. What was great here is as the Fox News tried to use that bait and switch by lying, by deletion of clips, she pointed it out immediately. She didn't just freeze up and say, oh, my God, it's not the right clip. What am I going to say? She pointed it out. You guys at Fox News, that's not what he said. In other words, you guys are lying to your people by omission. And then she let him have it. And you know how you know uh, he, he, he felt like I got caught? Whereas he was interrupting her all of the times, constantly interrupting her. He knew he was caught. And because he was caught, he was so shocked that she, oh my God, this woman is smart. She got it. I better watch what's the next set of words I, I, I'm going to use now because she's going to get me. She's going to get me. These, these, these incompetent, Liars cannot come close to the intellect of this woman. We know they can't possibly come close to the intellect of this woman at all. And, you know, it really irks them. And it irks a lot of folks that that's the case, right? It's a new era, baby. 
Paul Fleming says Texas is preparing to put Robert Robertson to death in what would be the nation's first execution involving a case of shaken baby syndrome, even though it was, I mean, it's amazing that they're putting an innocent guy to die. That is what we, but we do that all the time. We, we sentence innocent women to death if we can't give them uh, health care, prenatal health care, right? It's a shame. It's a shame. It's a shame. All right. Let's see what else we got here. Uh, Brisa de Egberto Willis, he is doing it again. Never learns. Trump's legal team tried to keep Stormy Daniels quiet. Yes, again. I know. After ahead of the election day 2016, Donald paid off Stormy Daniels ahead of 2024. He's trying to do it again. She must have some other stuff to talk about. I'm not going to read the whole thing there. That came on on Michael, my, uh, Rachel Maddo yesterday. Okay. It's, I guess we got somebody in there that think they're going to put, uh, Oh, check out some sort of a drug in your chat. I'm going to throw that into your chat. I mean, <laughs> no, you won't get it here. All right. I have one last video. Uh, this one has to do with Trump and how he answers small business. The guy doesn't know what a small business is, guys. I want you guys to listen to this. This is funny as hell. There are two things here. Number one, Donald Trump is unable to to understand what a small business is. If you take a listen to what uh, Bloomberg, the Bloomberg reporter has asked him, they asked, what policies do you have for small businesses, which make up the vast majority of individual entities in this country? And every single example Trump starts to give is a large business, a humongous corporation, and what he's going to do for them. That's number one. Number two, then they move on to tariffs, and he still is unable to explain what a tariff is and how a tariff would work within the, the United States economy and affect it. I want you to listen to this, and then we'll take it on the other side. Isn't the problem with the way that you do these kind of deals, you're bound to deal with the big companies, it's the small companies who get hit by all these different yeah. things and can't find exceptions. Oh, we have exceptions. No, no, we had an exception. Well, I gave Apple an exception. Tim Cook is a great Apple. Business. Apple is not a small company. And no, no, please, please. No, don't but, give it but, he, but, but here's what the happened. question is about small business. Yes, but I what would make you do it, for them. No, but we have a very talented group of people. Bob Lighthizer did a very good job. We had great people. We had central casting. These are a great and a large group of people. We made exceptions uh, in the case of Apple. They need an exception. You know why? Because of Samsung. Samsung. He came to me and he said, Samsung makes a product similar to ours, very good product, the phones and other things. And because they're in South Korea, they don't have the tariffs because we're in China, we have the tariffs. I said, you happen to be right. You're not going to be able to compete. And but we had some of a small, but the ultimate small businesses yeah, come and see know, you. That, was, even, that was the question. The Mercedes Benz will start building in the United States. And they have a little bit, but you know what they really are? Assembly, like in South Carolina. But they build everything in Germany and then they assemble it here. They get away with murder because they say, oh, yes, we're building cars. They don't build cars. They take them out of a box and they assemble them. We could have our child do it. That was former President Trump yesterday being pressed on his economic policies by the editor in chief of Bloomberg News. And he suggested that children could do the job of auto plant workers. Let's bring in now co-anchor of CNBC Squawk Box and New York Times columnist Andrew Ross Sorkin. Andrew, there is so much to sift through yeah. from Trump's appearance in front of the Economic Club of Chicago yesterday. He still has no answer, none, about what he would do for small businesses, which, as Joe Scarborough reminds us, uh, you know, is the sort of bedrock of Republican talking points. Uh, you know, his arguments on tariffs are controversial and inaccurate, to say the least. So you, you, you take your pick. Just what? struck out to you yesterday? Look, I just focused on the tariff issue over and over again because he didn't really address how he's going to make the math work. I think that you look at what most economists say, uh, this could ultimately cost something like 15 trillion dollars. Now, he says it's going to be used as a negotiating ploy, a cudgel that he's going to use with other countries. But 
What's not being expressed in that conversation is the idea of what other countries are going to do and how that's going to relate to our ability to export. One of the things that just happened in the last 24 hours, as an example, uh, is uh, a Chinese state group is now decided that they want to investigate uh, whether Intel should be allowed to sell certain chips in China. Now, we've made certain types of uh, uh, moves this way, but now there's a retribution in China. So what's that going to do to Intel and its ability to output? He's talking about Mercedes. You don't think that in Germany they're going to say, well, we're going to actually have to have to raise the tariffs on U.S. car imports into those countries. So it's not simply that it's going to cost the American consumer more to buy a Mercedes in the United States. It's what's going to happen to American automobile manufacturers and their ability to sell in other places. And I feel like that has not been enough part of the conversation. I've talked about it before. American farmers, uh, one group that, that, that I think as a country people seem to love are very anxious about what it's going to do to exports and American farmers ability to export outside of the United States. Let's be clear here because this is very important. The fact that Donald Trump cannot understand what a small business is and point out anything that he will do for small businesses, even as Kamala Harris is able to give you a point to a point for point identifying a set of policies that she's going to give not only to help small businesses, but to help families, which indirectly as well will help small businesses shows the bias of the mainstream media, specifically with regards to uh, Kamala Harris, VP Kamala Harris versus former President uh, uh, <laughs> Trump. Let's be clear here. She has policies. Trump does not. Trump bloviates his answers, as you saw there. But worse is that the media treats it as if, Miss Harris, we need more. Miss Harris, we need more. Keep moving the goalposts. And when it comes to Donald Trump, he's asked the same questions over and over. He's the, he does not answer it. And there doesn't seem to be a penalty for his ineptitude or his lack of understanding, even what a small business is. So when we talk about the media, the media bias, and much more, these are the kinds of things that we're talking about. Now, on the tariff part, that the mainstream media doesn't point out every time he says he's going to throw up tariffs, that a tariff is nothing more than taxes on the goods you're bringing in, and the country of origin does not pay the tariff. You do. But there are even deeper problems with tariffs not implemented correctly. Let me digress. Tariffs are important to maintain certain industries in your country. Because if we, if we left complete laissez-faire, free, free uh, market uh, com commerce, what you get is the countries that have the cheapest labor costs, horrendous environmental laws, etc., they will just manufacture everything and the first world countries will just let them pollute their lands and buy it here and bring it to the United States. Now, what tariffs have the ability to do is tariffs don't allow. Tariffs can cost in things like, well, if they're not treating their environment correctly and we are, we price that in and we're saying, OK, you're going to have to apply a particular tariff to these things. Done in a good manner, you don't create a tariff war or anything like that. But the way that Trump is planning on implementing it is really just a sales tax so that he can reduce taxes on the rest of the country or not the rest of the country on the billionaires. Because what he wants to do is he wants to apply a tariff on everything. And then, of course, you are the one who pay the increased price for everything in that tax that goes into the coffers. And then by that tax going into the coffers, they can reduce the taxes that the billionaires pay. This is not conjecture. This is how it works. And the media is not sufficiently explaining to the American people that a tariff is yet 
yes, it's a tax, but above and beyond the tax, it is a destroyer of companies. Because again, farmers are going to be exported. If, if you go ahead and put a tariff on something that's coming from China, China will do exactly what they did before. We're not going to buy your soybeans anymore. We'll buy them from Brazil. We're not going to buy your apricots anymore. We'll buy them from Thailand. And they'll keep doing that sort of a thing. And it hurts our businesses because you know what? The world is made strong and full of producers. The mainstream media has to do its job. It has to point out that Donald Trump will wreck the economy. And we have a candidate with written policies, unlike Trump, that'll tell us how the economy will do. And you know what? The Nobel Prize economists agree. The Wall Street Journal agrees. Wall Street agrees. Again, normally these are the people that Republicans like. Are you going to allow ideology to have you vote for somebody that's going to make you poor and destroy your economy? A question that you have to answer. Absolutely. So a question that you have to answer. Anyway, folks, uh, I'm taking calls now. Those are the three videos that I did for everybody. You can give me a clue. Uh, I'd call on 281-823-7747. Uh, every, everybody wants a laugh. Eric says that that presentation was clueless. <laughs> now that is funny. You know, um, you know, you know what, you, you know what is, I, I find ironic the most dangerous thing. <laughs> well, I'm not going to say that that wouldn't be so nice. All right, let's continue. Let's continue. Uh, from uh, welcome aboard Peggy Lopez. Como estas, mi hermanita? Glad to have you here, my sister. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Uh, I guess the word salads, if your comprehension isn't there, maybe. I don't know. Maybe you should. If you, I tell you what, maybe when we go to coffee, we can sit down and identify one word at a time so that it's no longer a word salad, but you understand what the words are actually saying. We can do that, brother. All right, uh, from Paul Fleming, Norman Ornstein says, when the history of this period is written, Mitch McConnell will be near the top in the list of villains and how he is making a bid to near the top of the list of moral cowards. McConnell's statement to the AP, whatever I may have said about President Trump pales in comparison to what J.D. Vance, Lindsey Graham and others have said about him, but we are all on the same team now. <laughs> Amazing. He is such a wackadoodle, according to Bridge MCP. There is that clapping again, Egberto. Don't know what it is, Bridge. I may have to go look something up. Mark Cuban says, according to Paul Fleming Sr., you know, in my career, I've learned a lot about business, including how tariffs work. This is the same guy who also thought Mexico would pay for the wall. But we don't even have to go there. I mean, we understand how tariffs work. I import products into the United States. I used to have to pay a tariff on the boards that I designed. Let me tell you how it works. Uh, We design a board, uh, a RS-232 serial communication board that we couldn't find all, with all the features we wanted. So what I did is I went with Jerry Pace. I drew out the schematics of the card. I asked him to turn that schematic into the, the silk screen for the, uh, to get it manufactured. We couldn't get it manufactured in the United States at the low quantities that we had at an affordable price. So I shifted over the, the design over to a friend in Taiwan who I was already buying boards from. And the guy in Taiwan said, okay, I'll build these boards. And we buy them about 100 boards at a time. Now, when those boards come in, that Chinese manufacturer charges me a price for those boards. Let's say he charges me $10 per board and I buy 100 boards. That's $1,000, right? I'm teaching the tariff, how tariffs work. That's $1,000. When that board comes into U.S., to the US, it goes through customs. Well, what you have is a forwarder that gets all the paperwork before the board comes in, etc. And that forwarder sends me 
And um, in those days when I did it, they'll send me a fax or, or whatever. And it would say, your product from XY Taiwan LTD came in. The tariff, and they give you the sheet of paper, the tariff on these products are 2%. I think on the hardware that I bought, the tariff was 2%. So whatever I paid to the Chinese company for those boards, I had to pay the United States government 2% for me to get those boards into my hands. It wasn't the Chinese company that paid the 2% to get the boards to me. It was me who had to pay the 2% for those boards. Okay? And that means when I priced those boards, I included the 2% on those boards. That is how tariffs work. It's not ma magic. It's not nuclear science or anything like that. It's just a tax. And then when the government charges me that tax, FedEx or UPS or DHL or Airborne would then bring the products to my place. That is how tariffs work. Now, people may say, well, the Chinese company may then drop their costs, their price, so that the price stays the same, even after paying the tariffs. At that point, what happens? It doesn't really matter. That cost is still passed on to somebody. But you, guess what? The Chinese company will not pay the price of the tariff because, first of all, their prices are bare bones when they're selling it to the American uh, manufacturer. So Donald Trump does not know what he's saying. Donald Trump, like we all know, does not have a lot upstairs. And for the people who continue to support him, you know, they, they well, you wonder a whole lot. The businessmen that support him are far and in between right now. There's not one Fortune 500 company that you will find supporting Donald Trump because they don't support those policies. They simply do not support those policies. Okay, anybody wants to call me, I don't have any more, um, any more videos to show and we still have about seven minutes to go. So give me a call to it, one 727 If anybody wants to call in, Repeat in that telephone number, 281-823-7747. ¿Quién me quiere llamar para ahora? Si quiere hablar, llámame por favor. One more time, 281-823-7747. All right, folks, uh, let's see what else we got. Um, uh, tomorrow, I'll have an interview with a state a texas state congressperson well a representative running for representative that thinks he's going that you know he, he's trying to rebuild a particular district but i don't think it's necessary bridge mcp la hermosa amiga mia como estas how you doing bridge hey how you doing <clears throat> i'm doing fine and, and i forgot what i wanted to say <laughs> oh and do people know that the Trump thing that he did on the other, whatever that network is called, from Fox, but with that woman, those um, women that run the orders, it was all women, are all Republican and are all planning on voting for Trump and all handpicked and invited to go there. So that was a setup for him to look good. People don't realize the depth of their dishonesty. It's it's a it's mind boggling that no one knows this, especially the MAGA people. They just repeat whatever they hear. They don't know what to say until they tell them to. Then they repeat it. They have no brain of their own. But I just wanted to know if you knew that. Yes, I did. And let me tell you worse, Breach. At first, those are the, that's what I would say. Ah, oh, they don't know that they're being fooled. But uh, you know, there there was. You remember uh, a few weeks ago. Eric, I think it was Eric, came on to that made the, Eric made me do some thinking when he came to our Ask Egberto anything. 
and I continued. And, and in fact, Eric had some backing from Brother Tom, uh, uh, our Brother Tom Zarni, uh, in which we were talking about not really insulting these folks about uh, the sycophancy, et cetera, right? But then after that, you know, when we pointed out a few things that were irrefutable, like you just said, right? That it was a setup. The, the, the thing with all the women there that were voting for Donald Trump, that was a setup made to fool the MAGA people, okay? And everybody else. They know, they know it's a setup. If you listen, look, let me give an example. We have Eric in the chat right now. We have CSEC in the chat. I explained how tariffs worked. Works, not worked, works. And uh, we also explained before a few other things, and he called it a word salad. Now, <laughs> okay, think about I, I want you to think about that. All right. These people are supporting a person, right, that is going to raise the prices of their products. Here it is. They're, they want to attack Biden administration. Because the eggs went up in price, not because of a flu, but because the, the companies decided that they could stiff the American people. So they raised the prices. That's called inflation. Now, Donald Trump is about to not raise, not the private sector raising the prices. Donald Trump directly, by applying those tariffs in the way he applies it, are going to inflate the prices. And let, let me show you how. The, the mentality works, Breeze, because you need to see this. Uh, I, I, I'm, glad that, I'm glad that Eric is still bloviating in the chat, because here's what Eric says. Tariffs are so small. Let me tell you how silly a statement like that is. Trump has told you what the numerical value of the tariff is going to be. 20%. <laughs> I know. He, I mean, he has told you, you back, it is, that's a 20% inflation rate. And he's supposed to be an accountant? What school did he go to? It's scary. I don't understand. I because mean, I understand that Eric, he could be different on the Ask Egberto. And that fooled me. Because in chat, he's not the same. Those stupid faces and the ridiculous comments that he makes. But when you I mean, talk it, to him, he sounds different. Yeah, but it's a, but, but, but Bridge, me. this here, Bridge, 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 Sister Bridge, this is in writing. Look at the other thing that he writes. He puts, tariffs have not provided a meaningful uh, of revenue before the U.S. government since the 1900s. Existing imports <laughs> duties on goods raised 80 billion. Yeah, you know why? Because we didn't have to, we, because we kept dropping tariffs. Trump is saying we right. want to apply them. So all those numbers will change. <laughs> right. I mean, oh my God. if you read um, Heather, Heather Cox Rich, Richardson, I mean, she's, she's unbelievable. I don't know, it was a week or two ago, she did a whole thing on tariffs from the very right. beginning when they started, how they did try to work. And then they went back and realized this is not working. And I don't know if it was FDR or one of the people back then in the 30s. 40s they changed it and switched it and changed the whole system and it worked Hold on a, hey, Bidige, and then they went and changed on, it back Bidige, stay on let me take uh, i want to i want to uh take up another call here as well stay on all right it's but I don't dr it's john j tice how are you doing sir i'm good Amiga mia. Como uh, hey, you i'm your, listening your, your to you talk about okay. yeah turn your radio down a I bit john yeah, I did. I was listening to you talk about tariffs and there's something else that nobody that hasn't really been talked about a lot. Uh-huh. I mean, Trump calls for 100% tariffs on imported cars, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, to help American auto manufacturers. Well, if I'm an American auto manufacturer, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to raise my price by 70-80%. Exactly. So it's still cheaper than a Chinese car, but I can make a lot more profit. Exactly. And, you know, it, and it, so and, it doubles the sort of risk of inflation because not only does it make foreign products more expensive, American manufacturers then have an incentive to raise their prices, too. 
Exactly. And, and, and you know, the, all of the, the, the Nobel Prize economists are telling you this, but it, 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 and it's deeper than that as well, Dr. Thais. Let me tell you what the other thing that they don't tell you, right? They don't tell you that it also, let's say uh, it, it comes to something that you really hurt com- country B. Country B then goes ahead and says, well, I am going to stop buying your soybeans like they did a couple of years ago, when or a few years ago, when Trump had uh, put the tariffs on. And those farmers in Michigan and those farmers in Wisconsin, they're screaming their heads off because they now can't export. OK, right. Yeah, uh, it I mean, leads to retaliation, whether it's mm-hmm. quit buying or put tariffs on our goods. <clears throat> Exactly. I mean, this is this was the effect of Smoot Hawley. Exactly. In the lead up to the Great Depression. So, yeah, I mean, it's crazy. But realize no matter how many Nobel Prize economists say this, remember what J.D. Vance said. The experts are always wrong. Right. There's exactly. a real dismissal of expert knowledge. So the minute you called me Dr. Tice, a bunch of Trump supporters said, well, he's wrong. But Doc, let me give you let me let me show you something else that weird people don't understand things, right? Here's what Mike Cisak puts in his chat. Japan, Europe, China already have a hundred percent tariff on US car manufacturers. What they don't understand is if you are in a low a, a low cost country, a country that's not used to buying, let's say, American goods or whatever. Those tariffs don't matter. We need China more than China needs. We need China's manufacturing more than China needs our products. <laughs> I mean, it is they they just don't get or they, it's not that they don't get it. They don't want to get it. But anything else, Doc, I got my, I'm a little bit over time right now. OK, we'll talk to you later. Thank you, my brother. All right. Uh, anyway, folks, uh, bridge. MCP, thank you for that as well. Uh, let me let me tell you guys, uh, we are we got to close this baby down. But beforehand, you know, I need to do my ass. Please support the show by becoming a paid subscriber of our newsletter. How can you do that? You can become a paid subscriber of our newsletter by going to politicsdoneright.com slash newsletter. Subscribe and become a paid subscriber at politicsandright.com slash newsletter. But there are many other ways to support the program. You can support the program by simply going to politicsandright.com slash support. And it has all the different methods in which to support the program. But again, the oh, thank you. Bridge always has to remind me to put out the swag. If you want to get our cups or t-shirts and everything else, please go to politicsandright.com slash store. You can get our T-shirts, our mugs, our towels, the whole works. Patricia F. Forker, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, Patrick Magnus says, Japan drivers sit on the right side. We don't build those cars. That's another issue as well. Uh, anyway, folks, the taxfoundation.org is a fraud. Let's remember that. Uh, let's continue uh, again. Uh, folks, please support the program by going to politicsdoneright.com slash newsletter. My name is Egberto Willis. This is Politics Done Right. And you guys know how I end this baby. I am what? Out! We spend a lot of time deconstructing the news, trying to trying to parse it into a form that everybody can understand. We try to find those little nitpicks where uh, it goes, it flies above the fray, etc. If you really like these videos that we do, I want to ask a big favor. Please go ahead, number one, subscribe to our channel, and number two, please join if you can. Thank you so kindly for watching. Keep watching. Please remember to share. We must populate the entire internet with our progressive message, a message that we know is what most Americans say that they want. So help us please join.